Christian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. Moss Adams LLP, certified public accountants and consultants, providing industry smart tax, assurance and consulting solutions to help businesses and their owners succeed since 1913. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. I'm not going to be surprised that recent documents show just how much of the Kennedy assassination was covered up by the CIA and the FBI. The truth about Vietnam, what Oswald was doing in Mexico City, and the attempted assassination of Fidel Castro are all still being uncovered. One of the central figures in CIA misdeeds was Jim Angleton, and one of our guests has a new book out on the subject. On this program, we'll examine what we know and don't know about Oswald's trip to Mexico City six weeks prior to the assassination. We'll also take a quick look at how Vietnam and Kennedy's idea of peace may have been a factor in the events of November of 63. Finally, we'll examine just what new documents do and do not tell us about the government's role in the cover-up, so let's meet our experts starting on my right. Carmine Savistano is an author, researcher, and editor-in-chief of the Neapolis Media Group. His writings focus on intelligence, government, government, and international politics. He studied legal documents for years. He's written over 60 research articles based on verifiable evidence. He makes regular appearances in the independent media. He's had several research findings accepted by the Mary, Mary Farrell Foundation and the Assassination Archives and Research Center. Carmine, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. It's good to be and here. And sitting next to you is Jefferson Morley. He's a veteran Washington journalist who has been writing about the JFK story for national publications since 1983. The editor of the JFK Facts blog, Morley, is the author of two biographies which explore the CIA's role in the events of 63. One is The Ghost, The Secret Life of CIA Spymaster James Jesus Angleton, and Our Man in Mexico, Winston Scott and the Hidden History of the CIA. His JFK journalism is collected in an e-book entitled CIA and JFK, the Last Assassination Secrets, and in 2009, he was awarded the Penn Oakland Censorship Award for his JFK reporting. Jeff, welcome to Dallas. Thank you, Dennis. Let me start by just going to your most recent book, which is called Ghost. I found it a fascinating read, to say the least. And while there is a big portion of the book having to do with the CIA and Jim Angleton and JFK, give that viewer some sense of what the CIA was all about this time, Alan Dulles and Jim Angleton, how they got together and what Angleton's job was during this time. So Jim Angleton was one really could be considered one of the founding fathers of the CIA. He went into the Office of Strategic Services, which was America's first foreign intelligence service during World War II. After the war, that morphed into the CIA, which was created in 1947. And already by 1947, he's just 30 years old, he is a rising star in the CIA. He had met Alan Dulles during their time in the OSS. Jim Angleton was the head of the Rome station of the OSS. Alan Dulles was the head of the Switzerland station of the OSS, and they worked together during the war. Like a lot of people, Dulles was immediately impressed with Angleton's creativity, his precocity, his imaginative approach to intelligence. And so those two men were really linked from the start. Dulles becomes the director of the CIA in 1952, um, and that really helps Angleton's ascension. In 1954, Angleton began to propose to Dulles that the CIA needed to emphasize counterintelligence. Intelligence, of course, is the aspect where you go and you try and steal the other guy's secret. Counterintelligence is you try and prevent the other guy from doing that to you. And it was Angleton's insight that the CIA needed to step up its counterintelligence efforts to prevent penetration by the KGB. And so he proposed to Dulles the creation of a counterintelligence staff, and he proposed that he head it. And Dulles agreed to that in 1954, and in December 1954, the counterintelligence staff was created. That became Angleton's platform for power. 
Within five years, he had 200 people working for him. And really, um, he had, since he had the complete confidence of Alan Dulles, um, he created really a CIA within the CIA. So in this very secretive organization, you have a super secretive organization headed by this very brilliant and uh, aggressive, really, um, personality, James Angleton. And so he becomes, from 1954 to 1974, a real power in the CIA. And his influence is felt in a wide variety of areas. He's most famous for his mole hunt. He became convinced around 1959 that there was a mole, a Soviet spy, working somewhere in the CIA. And he began to search for that um, for that character, and that became, that, that was kind of his great white whale, uh, pursuing the, the mole for the rest of his career. But along the way, and I tell the story in my book, which has not really been told before, he became very interested in an obscure young man named Lee Harvey Oswald. And the part of the story that's not really known is, in November 1959, his staffers, the counterintelligence staff, open the CIA's first file on Lee Harvey Oswald. And for the next four years, as Oswald goes from the United States to Moscow to Minsk, back to Fort Worth to New Orleans to Mexico City and back to Dallas, Jim Angleton's staff is informed of his whereabouts every step of the way. So the story that was told to the American people that this fellow named Oswald kind of came out of nowhere and killed the president, that story was false. It was a cover story for the fact that Oswald was the object of intense CIA interest on the part of Jim Angleton's staff for four years before he was arrested for killing Kennedy. Okay, so let's let's take Oswald, and when he joined, he joined the uh, service, was actually sent to, was it Tokyo? Is that where he was sent? He was at the Atsugi Air Base in Japan. He was a radar operator. He had a security clearance. Yeah, security clearance. Did he work on the U-2 stuff or something? Did I remember something like that? Well, the, the U-2 flights took off from that air base. So, um, you know, he, he could have been aware of that. Yeah. All right. So then uh, do you think he really um, had decided he was a communist and he, and he went to Russia because he was a communist? Or are you saying there's something more to the story? What do you, what do you think? Well, there's several curious aspects to the story. Oswald, uh, a 20-year-old high school dyslexic dropout, when he decides to go to the Soviet Union, he decides to go to the only place in the world, literally the only place in the world, where you could immediately get a visa to get into the Soviet Union. He went to Helsinki. Um, there's no record of how he got to Helsinki, so that's curious. Um, his choice of place is curious, and so then he goes there. Was he a CIA? Was he a false defector? You know, we can speculate about that. That's possible. I'd rather not talk about, I only talk about things that I'm sure of. Mm -hmm. So he goes there and he lives in the Soviet Union from uh, October 1959 to June of 1962. All right. And then when he comes back, I understand he didn't re have any real problems coming back. Somebody just met him at the boat. In fact, didn't uh, one government agency loan him four or five hundred dollars enough to get he and his wife and daughter back or do yeah, I remember that right? Th this, this is curious you know it was known to the State Department and the CIA that he had offered to share military secrets with the Soviet Union. He easily could have been arrested immediately upon his return simply for making that offer and the fact that he wasn't arrested is is odd to say the least but the, the, I think the important thing to understand about Angleton is and Oswald is they didn't lose track of him. When, when Oswald returned to the, to the United States in the summer of 62, he was interviewed twice by FBI agents. We now have, um, was declassified in the, in the 1990s, the original documents and the routing slips that were on top of them. The FBI interviews of Oswald were forwarded to Angleton's office, and we have the signature of one of his top aides on there. So we know that they were informed not only that Oswald had gone, but they were paying attention to him when he returned. Okay. Now, Carmine, you, just in the things that we've talked about here, you've looked at a lot of documents, you've done a lot of research. Anything you'd like to add to uh, up to this point? Sure. I think another thing that supports what Jefferson was saying is that Oswald was also an item of 